Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Well, early, earlier this week, on Monday, Em and I took Madison for the first time to our favorite hiking spot up in the Sam Houston National Forest. But before we went hiking, obviously we had to get some coffee, so we stopped at a coffee shop in New Waverly called Honey's. And we got our drinks, and the first thing I noticed was that the prices in New Waverly are like half of the prices in Houston. It was amazing. The second thing I noticed was the sleeve on, on the coffee. Uh, on, the, on the sleeve, on the one side, it had the logo of the coffee shop. On the other side, it had this phrase. It said, on this earth too, and then there was a blank. And so what they did was the, the people who made the drinks wrote in their answer with a sharpie. And for the life of me, I cannot re remember what they wrote. I was trying to think of it. I asked Em. She didn't remember either. It was honestly something kind of cliche that you would expect, like a teenage girl to write. Um, but no offense to any teenage girls. Um, but as I read that, it made me think. I was, at, at that moment, I was not remotely answered to, or remotely prepared to answer that question at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning. I was like, I'm just looking for caffeine, not an existential crisis. But, and so maybe that's where you are too. But it made me think. It made me think how I would answer that question. So I'm going to ask you that question too, and I know you might not be prepared for it, but I'm going to ask you, what are you on this earth to do? Uh, that, that coffee cup and that question came back into my mind later in the week as I studied the text. Because in this lesson that I'm going to read to you from Philippians 3, it becomes pretty clear that Paul has an answer for himself to that question. He knows what he's here on this earth to do. And I think that's something that we all want, right? We want to have an answer to that question. We envy people who do have an answer to that question. Because when you see people like that, they just act with more confidence and more clarity. It makes decision-making easier for them. It, it drives everything that they do. And so this is something we want. We want to know this. If we don't have an answer to this question, we feel pulled in all kinds of different directions. We chase one thing, looking for purpose and fulfillment. And if we don't find it, then we go chasing after another thing. And we feel like we never really accomplish what we set out to do. So Paul is going to give you his answer to that question this morning, and he's going to show you, as he does, how it transformed his life, past, present, and future. And he's going to show you how the same answer can transform your life, too. So I'm going to read the text verse by verse, but before I do that, I'm going to give you a little background on this reading. Paul is writing to the Philippian Christians, and he's writing to them from prison which if you read the letter, you would never guess because it's the most joyful of all of Paul's letters. He's constantly telling the Philippian Christians to rejoice in the Lord. He says it, he says it I didn't count, but tons of times throughout the, throughout the letter. But here, in chapter three, he takes a little break from telling them to rejoice because he has a warning for them. He wants to warn them about this group that has arisen in the Philippian congregation that's trying to worm their way in and teach the people in Philippi that if they want to be real Christians, it's not just about believing in Jesus. You also have to follow all of these rules. You have to follow the Jewish Old Testament Levitical laws. You have to, the one they put a ton of emphasis on is circumcision. You have to be circumcised. And he says, watch out for these people because that is not what Christianity is about. It's not about following rules. But he says, this is how he starts. He says, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. He says, if you want to play this game, if you want to turn Christianity into a competition of who can keep rules better, I'm going to win. So don't even try. He says, look at all the reasons in my past. He busts out this list of seven things. Seven in the Bible is the number, it's a divine number and it's the number of completeness. So it's not an accident that he gives them seven reasons why he is better at this than they are. He says, I'm going to give you a perfect list of reasons why if you want to put confidence in the outward aspects of spirituality, I'm going to beat you at that game. He starts off and he says, circumcised on the eighth day. 
These were people that were, were putting emphasis on, on that rite of circumcision. And Paul says, those guys are Gentile converts, converts to Christianity. They were circumcised as adults. I was circumcised on the eighth day like it says in the law of Moses. My circumcision is, is better than theirs. And then he says, of the people of Israel. He says, I am not just adopting Jewish customs and Jewish laws. I'm not just trying to become a Jewish person. I was born in the people of Israel. I am one of God's chosen people. Not only that, he says, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. That is important because that means he can trace his lineage back all the way to Benjamin. The, the 10 northern tribes had gotten carried off in captivity by the Assyrians, and when, they never really came back. They got mixed in with different people, and so if your lineage was from one of those tribes, you couldn't usually trace it all the way back. He says, I am of the tribe of Benjamin, and, and that means that my tribe was the one that was faithful to David. My tribe was, belonged to, I'm the, I'm the tribe of Benjamin, which is the tribe of the favorite son of Jacob, the, one of the favorite sons. And so he says, I can trace my lineage all the way back to that. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews, he says. If you look up Hebrew on Wikipedia, my picture is going to pop up with the article. He says, I still speak Hebrew. These people speak Aramaic and Greek. They can't even read the Old Testament in the original languages. I can't. And then he goes on. He says, as for zeal, persecuting the church. He says, you want to know how zealous I was for keeping the law? I went out and tracked people down who weren't keeping the law, and I killed them. I, I was willing to kill for my observance of the law. I skipped one. I'll go back. In regard to uh, the law, a Pharisee, he says, I was... I was so observant of the law, I went through the most rigorous schooling you can possibly go through. I studied under Gamaliel, this respected teacher at the time. I was a Pharisee. I was so zealous, I was persecuting the church. And finally, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul says, you can ask anyone, anyone out there, if you would have asked them if there was anything they could point out in my life, in my outward obedience to the law, if there was anything wrong with it, he said nobody would have been able to point out a thing. My outward obedience to the law was perfect. But, he says, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. He says all those things, he breaks out accounting language here. He says all the things I had in my profit column I've moved them over to my loss column. They've, they've completely changed, changed perspective for me. So what was it that brought this change of perspective? It was meeting Jesus. When Paul met Jesus, the Holy Spirit showed him that the way he had been trying to relate to God was completely wrong. It, it's not about following rules. It's about a relationship with God. It's not about strict adherence to principles it's about the person of Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. And so he realized all these things I used to consider gains are now losses to me. And that's what he's trying to tell the Philippians. And that's what he's trying to tell us too. Because that mindset is still alive and well today. Some of you may have grown up in a church like this where, where they, they told you about Jesus, they told you what Jesus had done for you, but the tone was more about, made it seem like it was more about following rules than it was about a relationship with God. There's all this pressure to do and say the right things, and if you don't do and say the right things, you can't be a Christian. And when that happens, there are a couple things, a couple results that are possible. One of them is that you leave. You get frustrated with all of the guilt because you can't live up to those, you can't follow all those rules, you can't live up to all those principles, and so you get frustrated and you walk away from the church. The second thing that can happen is maybe even more dangerous. You can stay, and you can get really good at following all those rules. And as you get really good at following all those rules, you can look at all the people who don't follow the rules as well as you do, and you can start to look down on them. And you get overwhelmed too, not with guilt, because you don't think you should have any because you're following all the rules. Not, you get overwhelmed not with guilt, but with pressure. Pressure to keep up that obedience. 
pressure to keep following all the rules because that's where you've really put your hope. That's what you're looking to for your sense of righteousness before God. And that's where Paul was before he met Jesus. But then everything changed. He goes on, he says, what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may, be, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from, or, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. See, when Paul met Jesus, he realized that all the things he had been putting his confidence in were garbage. Garbage is is really a, kind of a soft translation of that word. It, that word can mean garbage. It can also mean excrement. It can mean anything between garbage. It's, it's something that's smelly, that's repulsive. That's what he's saying. It's repulsive to me now. And it's not that these things were bad. Some of them were, like killing Christians, not a good thing to have on your resume. But some of these things were good. The fact that he knew God's word so well, that he could read it in the original language. Some of these things were good things. But Paul says, that is what's so dangerous about self-righteousness. When you look to those things, it's not about whether they're good or bad. It's when you look to those things as your ultimate sense of confidence. When you try to make yourself righteous through those things. And that's what makes it dangerous. Because most of the time, self-righteousness is based on good things. That's what we're tempted to do too. We're tempted to base our confidence and our sense of righteousness on the fact that we come to church or that you're a good parent or that you're a good moral person who treats other people with kindness. Those are good things, but it's not about whether they're good or bad. It's about if you're trying to find your sense of confidence, your sense of righteousness in those things. And Paul says, if you are, then those things are garbage. He says, I consider all of that in my past life garbage in comparison to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He says it's not about the rigorous observation of rules, it's about the righteousness that we've been given through faith. That's what Paul says Christianity is about. It's not about the the strict adherence to principles It's about the person of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. It's it's not about climbing a ladder to try and get to God. It's about us being stuck in a pit, unable to get ourselves out of it, and God reaching down and saving us. It's about Jesus, who is willing to lose everything, including his life, so that we could gain him and be found in him. And what that means to to be found in Christ is that when God goes looking for righteousness from you, when he goes looking for righteousness, he's not going to look for evidence of it in your life. He's going to look in Christ's life because our life is hidden in Christ. He's going to go and look at Jesus and he's going to find righteousness and he's going to put that righteousness under our name. And so that righteousness that we've been given as a gift from God changes everything. It's what changed Paul's perspective on his past. It's what changed his confidence in the present, and it's what changes his pursuit, he says, in the future. That's what he's going to go on to talk about in the last verses. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, this is it. This is my passion. This is my purpose in life. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to tap into that power, the power that conquered death. I want to experience that power in my life. I want to participate in his sufferings, which means I want to be on his side, even if it means I have to suffer for it. And I want to attain to the resurrection of the dead and become like him in his death. He says that's what happens through baptism. Through baptism, we die to all of the things that we used to put our confidence in. 
We die to sin and we're given a new life. We're resurrected to live a new life. And not only that, we're promised the resurrection of the dead and we're promised heaven with Christ forever. Paul says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. I'm not there yet, he says, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is Paul's goal. This is his goal. This is the one thing he was put on this earth to do. He is on this earth to know Christ. And maybe you're thinking, well, that's not that life-changing. I know who Christ is. He's the guy with the cross and the walking on water, changing water into wine. But that's not what Paul is talking about. He's not talking about knowing facts about Jesus. In Greek, there are two different verbs. There's a verb for knowing facts, and there's a verb for knowing something by experience. And that's the verb that Paul uses here. He wants to know by experience. He wants to know Christ. He wants to grow deeper in his relationship with him. He wants to experience the power of Christ in his life. It's kind of like, it's kind of like marriage. When we got married, I didn't suddenly say, all right, Em, I know who you are now, so we don't have to go on dates anymore. We don't have to talk to each other. We don't need to communicate anymore because I know you. I know where you grew up and who your family is and where you've lived. Obviously, I didn't do that, right? It's not about, the goal is not marriage. The goal is not knowing facts. The goal is a relationship that keeps growing over time. I'm never going to reach a point in our marriage where I just say, all right, we've made it. Let's maintain the status quo, right? The goal is to keep growing in that relationship. And it's the same with Jesus. We know who he is by faith, but we never stop trying to know him more. We never stop trying to learn more about him and trying to experience a deeper relationship with him. We don't just try to maintain the status quo. We don't just try to do just enough to keep up the relationship. We want to know him by experience. We want to deepen the relationship and grow in our love for him. That's what Paul is saying. He says, I pursue. He uses that verb again. It's the same verb he used to talk about persecuting Christians. He says, with the same zeal, I used to track people down and kill them. Now I have a different goal. Definitely a better goal, right? I, I am chasing after this relationship with Jesus. I pursue the knowledge of Christ. See, what comes through as you read Paul's words here is that he wants to know Christ more than he wants anything else in the entire world. He wants to know Christ so badly that he was willing to lose everything for it. That's what he says. I have lost all things. He lost his entire reputation. He lost what he built his life on. He lost all of it, and he says it was worth it because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul says, I am on this earth to know Christ, and that's what he wants you to say too. That's what he wants your answer to that question to be. I may not have been ready for that question on Monday morning, but I'm ready now. I have my answer ready to go. I am on this earth to know Christ, because knowing Christ changes everything. It really does change everything, but I'm going to give you three things as we close that it changes. First of all, it releases you from the pressure, the unrelenting pressure of self-righteousness. You don't have to earn your own salvation. You don't have to earn your own righteousness. You don't have to feel the pressure to keep up the obedience to the law because that's not where your confidence is. Your confidence is in the righteousness that Jesus won for you through his perfect life and his innocent suffering and death. The second thing it changes is it gives you unshakable confidence. Confidence that's, if, if you have confidence that's based on your obedience to the law, you're always on shaky ground. Because in a second, you could disobey a rule. You could do something wrong, and your confidence would be shattered. Your confidence is unshakable 
because it's based on the finished work of Jesus. He has already won this righteousness for you. He proved it by rising from the dead on Easter morning, and so nothing can shake your confidence. The last way it changes your life is that it gives you a new pursuit. If you're pursuing your own righteousness or your own confidence, your own success in life, that pursuit is always going to be emptying and exhausting. If you're chasing after your own righteousness, your own success, you're going to be chasing and that's going to wear you out. You're going to be straining towards that and it's, it's going to be exhausting. And when you get there, you're going to realize that those things that you've been trying to put your confidence in aren't reliable. And that is going to empty you. If you're straining ahead towards those things, there's always going to be a person like Paul who can say, if this is, if this is your ultimate thing, I can one-up you. I can do one better than you. And so those pursuits will always empty you and exhaust you. The pursuit of knowing Christ is different. Yes, it's a pursuit. Yes, he does use running and racing language. He says, I strain forward toward what's ahead. I press on to the goal. But it's not a pursuit that empties you and exhausts you. It's a pursuit that brings rest. It's a pursuit that brings fulfillment into your life instead of emptiness. Because the more you come to know Christ, the more you know about him, the more you know that he, what he said about himself, that his, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He says, come to me when you're weary and burdened and you'll find rest for your souls. The pursuit of knowing Christ is a pursuit that brings rest because we're not working for our own righteousness. We're resting in the righteousness of Jesus. So, forgetting what's behind and straining forward toward what's ahead. Let's press on toward our goal of knowing Christ because that is what we are on this earth to do. Amen.